Hi, everyone, and thank you for participating in today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar, which has been sponsored by Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. This 60-minute webinar will focus on the gun crime investigative cycle and bridging the gaps. Presenters for this fourth installment of our Crime Gun Intelligence webinar series will not only discuss specific investigative and intelligence programs and strategies that have been implemented in their respective agencies, but will also present solutions for bridging the gaps which help to ensure comprehensive and timely investigations that result in the successful prosecution of firearms-related cases. The webinar will also help participants develop strategies to prioritize the leads that are identified direct limited resources and budgets to achieve success, which can ultimately lead to a reduction in firearms violence in their communities. Now, I'm planning on leaving detailed uh, introductions for our first presenter, Brandon Huntley, but I did want to say that we are very grateful for our sponsor who is dedicated to educating justice personnel around the world about developing effective crime gun intelligence programs. Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology is a leader in forensic analysis, providing innovative and effective solutions like its unique technology, the Integrated Ballistics Identification System. IBIS is designed to find the needle in the haystack by discovering matches between pairs of spent bullets and cartridge cases at speeds well beyond human capacity. Ultra Electronics also helps experts obtain timely information so that they can make society a safer place. Now before we begin, I'd like to share just a few housekeeping details about the webinar. First, Altra has provided the presentation materials which can be downloaded directly from the GoToWebinar toolbar under Handouts. Second, although this is a listen-only event, you can enter any questions you have through the GoToWebinar toolbar and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. And finally, we have included a post-webinar survey, and we ask that you complete it. It does help us continually improve our ongoing programming. And with that, Brandon, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, on behalf of Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We're very happy to have two outstanding presenters with us today. Um, Daryl Smith, who I've had the opportunity to work with uh, for many years, uh, Daryl's a retired Phoenix Police Department detective, started the Gun Squad initiative there. Um, he's now an ATF contractor with uh, Shearwater Systems and Assistant Chief Paul Ludigate with the Cincinnati Police Department, where they've launched an outstanding crime gun intelligence initiative program there. And we're very fortunate to have them with us today to be able to share information regarding their programs. Um, I am now a forensic intelligence strategy manager with Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. I've been here for two years now, and I retired from the Phoenix Police Department uh, two years ago, where I uh, most recently served as a sergeant working with uh, the NIBIN and Crime Gun Intelligence uh, program since 2008. So I'm an IBIS user myself, and I supervised a group of uh, sworn and civilian folks that uh, not only worked on NIBIN and crime gun intelligence programs, but also were responsible for firearm investigations um, and weapon violations. Um, next slide, please. This is the, four, uh, this is the fourth installment of a six-part webinar series that we're sponsoring this year. So I know a lot of you have been, uh, have been able to participate in our previous webinars. Uh, again, we're very happy to provide these webinars throughout the year. You can see the next couple we have scheduled for September. Uh, and November, uh, forensics at the speed of crime and developing and implementing crime gun intelligence prosecution strategies uh, in November. So we're looking forward to those as well. Next. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Daryl and Assistant Chief Newdigate, uh, we're just going to go over some, some basic terminologies, um, some basic background information to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, some of this will be review for, for a lot of you, um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when we talk, talk about IBIS, that's the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, as Aaron mentioned earlier. Um, it's the technology. It's the standard in over 70 countries. Um, brass tracks is a system that's used for cartridge cases, so recovered cartridge casings that are left at crime scenes. Um, those that are test fired from firearms are entered into the brass tracks system and bullet tracks is available for bullets, uh, bullet technology, for, I'm sorry, for bullets. Um, with regard to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's a, right now we have about 630 plus systems in over 77 countries. 
In the United States, the program is NIBIN, the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, and that's administered by ATF. Um, there's over 170 sites in the United States currently. So NIBIN is the program, IBIS is the technology. Uh, when we refer to a NIBIN lead, um, those of you who are familiar and experienced with working with NIBIN and IBIS uh, may remember the term potential candidate for comparison, uh, potential hit. Um, that is now called a NIBIN lead. So when, uh, when you're doing the correlation reviews on the match point station and you find two cases that you think are linked, um, we're now referring to those as NIBIN leads. And Daryl and Assistant Chief Newtigate are going to talk about the importance of, of getting that information out to the investigators. Whereas a hit is you would take that lead and then that would be examined by a firearms examiner using a comparison microscope. Um, and that would be the confirmation process that would be involved if you need to have that done. And again, Daryl and Assistant Chief Newtigate are going to talk about um, programs and strategies that, uh, if you need to have that confirmed a lot of times you don't need to and you just get the lead out and you let the investigators work on that um, next slide so when we get into crime gun intelligence um, a couple of the important programs with crime gun intelligence crime gun tracing is a very important element with crime gun intelligence in the united states um, the tracing system is called e-trace it's an electronic trace system the great thing with eTrace is it's web-based, so you can enter the trace information once your agency has an MOU with ATF from any computer. Um, lots of good information can be obtained from eTrace, gun trafficking trends, identifying straw purchasers. You can utilize it um, strategically, tactically, uh, and administratively. A lot of great uses with it, uh, as well as in conjunction with the NIBIN program as well. Um, so. Gun, gun, I'm sorry, crime gun tracing is a very important element with uh, overall crime gun intelligence initiative. Next slide. So again, with crime gun intelligence, we look at two main components, NIBIN, which is gonna be the inside of the gun or the ballistics, and then tracing um, the outside of the gun, the serial number, make, model, caliber, importer. Next slide. So the inside data leads to the what? So that's NIBIN. It's going to link up crime to crime, or if you have a firearm in custody of the possessor of that gun, or if it's a found gun, um, at least that'll give you a link to that gun being used in, in different uh, shooting incidents. Next slide. And then the outside data leads to the who. So we're looking at tracing, um, DNA, fingerprints, forensic processing. Um, so that tells you who is the gun, who that gun has been associated with. Next slide. And crime gun intelligence, uh, in short, is basically anything that we, in law enforcement we can use to get these shooters off the street, stop them from offending. Um, it could also include many of the things that are listed here on this slide, as well as many other um, databases and resources that your agency or your, your region may have available. Um, the ATF Industry Operations has a lot of great uh, programs, the NCIC transactions, and again, all of this goes back to the IACP recommended firearm processing protocols um, that recommend NCIC tracing, um, the forensic processing, NIBIN, um, can also include um, gunshot detection systems such as ShotSpotter, crime gun intelligence management and mapping systems such as GunOps, which is a cloud-based program to help you track and identify these leads and um, work more efficiently and combining other resources such as license plate readers, um, pawn and par parole or probation data as well. Next slide. So breaking it down for today's purposes, and this comes from Pete Gagliardi, um, the author of the 13 Critical Tasks. Um, Pete is, has broken this down into thirds that we'll look at today for purposes of this uh, webinar and the investigative cycle overall. We're going to look at breaking the information and the evidence down into thirds. So first is respond and collect, the second is extract and analyze, and then the third is pursue and apprehend, and ultimately prosecute, give the prosecutors good, good cases uh, for, for their purposes. And what we'll be looking at today is to be able to bridge those gaps that are inherent between the three different parts of this investigative cycle. Chris, you can go to the next slide. Um, so what does that require? And what Daryl and Assistant Chief Newtigate are gonna talk about is a well-coordinated team to manage these handoffs and exchanges of data and information. So it's a very important to work together with Phoenix. The group works outside of the crime lab, but has a very close working relationship 
with the crime lab. And it's very important that they work effectively together um, as with the, the first responders, the folks that collect the evidence, property management folks, uh, Daryl and Assistant Chief Newgate will talk about the importance of that and, and different strategies that they have uh, they have put together. And also balancing the people, processes, and technology. Those of you familiar with peak ag, they already in the 13, 13 critical tasks are very well aware of that terminology and ba balancing people, processes, and technology. Chris, next one. And four critical steps for a successful NIBIN and crime gun intelligence initiative are comprehensive collection, timely turnaround, investigative follow-up, and then feedback. And all four of these are very, very important. And again, I'm gonna turn it over to Daryl here because it, between him, himself and Assistant Chief Newdigate, they're gonna talk about programs and strategies that they've implemented to accomplish these four critical steps. So with that, Daryl, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, if you go out to your lobby, I think there's uh, donuts and coffee out there. Uh, hopefully the donut ferry made it to yours, but I think one department didn't make it, so hopefully it's not yours. <laughs> Anyways, good morning. Um, I, as met Brandon mentioned, I am uh, retired from the Phoenix Police Department. I did uh, 31 years as a, a regular detective and worked mostly gun crimes, and after I retired, I stayed on for another uh, nine years as a reserve officer and just retired in December. Uh, my goal, uh, my role here in, in Arizona is to be the crime gun intelligence coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico um, when it, in regards to facilitating NIBIN and E-Trace programs for any department that needs it. Um, I try to bridge the gap between all the police departments to ensure that they all meet uh, the ATF's four keys to a successful NIBIN program that you just saw, and we'll cover all of those uh, in the next few slides. Slide. In Phoenix here, we have a unique program where the equipment is housed at Phoenix PD, but because of limitations of other departments, they don't have equipment, so they're all invited to come to the Phoenix Police Department and acquire their entries into the NIBIN system. They've all been trained. Uh, they can come down anytime. And we have machines that are um, outside of the lab setting and one machine that is inside the lab. However, anybody that's been trained in the Phoenix area or the state for that matter can are welcome inside the lab as well. In Phoenix right now, we have um, one uh, contract that's me, the Crime Gun Intelligence Coordinator, and I'll get into actually what I do. We have uh, two NIBIN techs that their only job is to do NIBIN uh, acquisitions for uh, mostly Phoenix PD. However, they'll help out any agency as well as doing correlations. We have uh, one ATF employee that assists me in working up the leads, but his job also is to look at the trace information and see if we can identify any uh, investigations there or straw purchasers or uh, purchases that might have given that gun off to our suspect. We have uh, one sergeant, Phoenix police sergeant, uh, one detective, one secretary, and a police assistant. And that's all we have at this point. On top of that, we also have um, some reserve officers that help us out and volunteers. And I'm getting some feedback. Anyway, sorry, I was interrupted by that. Um, we have about 20 Valley agencies that all take part in our Phoenix Metro NIBIN program. And as you see there, they come from all walks through the department. None of them are full-time NIBIN people. They all have NIBIN as their secondary or even sometimes their third down on the list to come in and do the NIBIN entries. So uh, it's a... Uh, it would be great if we had full-time, and like I said, the only ones we have full-time are our two NIBIN techs that are also contractors uh, with me. Slide. Mm. Now, um, these are facilitators. However, anybody in this position, in these positions, should know everybody's jobs because if somebody's out for an injury or a short time leave or something like that, the rest of the team should be able to pick up and keep the program moving along. 
the supervisors obviously manage the program and they stay in touch with the admin people, chiefs, administration of the police departments. And that's a very crucial, something that I can't keep up with because of working the leads and so on. Now our in, in, this industry ops person, uh, that ATF employee that I work with, he, again, he's in charge of doing the um, referrals for any kind of trace information and trafficking patterns that we might spot from a trace, even as a result of a, a Niven lead. Uh, the analysts, we have uh, three analysts in our office that uh, they take our leads and they process any kind of charts we need, uh, cell phone, social media, anything like that. And we put out a pretty good analytical program and uh, working packet to the investigators that's going to get the lead. Uh, the, again, my job, the coordinator, um, I facilitate the NIBIN and, and tracing as well. Um, I'm capable of entering NIBIN evidence as well and tracing guns if uh, a department needs assistance. Our special agents that we have, they have uh, in our office, we have four special agents that are assigned to work NIBIN leads that I find. And if uh, they get assigned a case, they're uh, responsible for reporting every week the um, follow-up that they've done and to see where we're at on the case. We've had very good success in the Phoenix area with having our agents working on these Niven hits because they have a little bit more time to uh, go out and really dig deep into these because you got to realize when we get a hit, a detective that might be assigned that case has probably received another 50 or 100 cases on his desk since this happened. Um, we also have task force officers that work with our NIBIN leads and work with our agents um, hand in hand on a daily basis. Slide. As I mentioned, we have uh, a brass tracks and a match point inside the lab, and then two of each, two uh, brass tracks and three match points outside the lab for correlations and for entries. And we have this regional approach to where we um, can invite anybody throughout the state to come down and, and join in on this. Now, if somebody wants to get involved in our program and they are not trained, there's some options there. They can either go to FT for training, they can go to ATF for training, or because our department has a trainer in-house, they can come to Phoenix PD and our trainer will uh, certify them and test them the same way that ATF does. They follow the ATF protocols and all that, so they can get up certified and then come down and use our equipment. The reason for the regional approach is, like I mentioned, some departments are limited with resources and it's a small department, so the, the amount of guns that are seized or the amount of evidence they uh, seize might not uh, qualify them, they may not be able to um, justify, I guess, um, a machine. So that's why we invite them there to the Phoenix PD. Um, with having this regional approach, it also really helps on the backlog of cases because as soon as they get them, smaller departments can come right down and enter their evidence and keep very current. And we stress is that um, departments always target their most current and freshest evidence in, and if there is any backlog, work on that secondary, but still concentrate on the most current thing because the detectives want to see a real fresh current case, not one that's a year old. So that's going to be their best bang right there. It actually reduces uh, lab requests also for um, having the lab personnel actually test fire a gun or put it into uh, into the knifing machine. With having all these personnel able to do it, that frees up the lab firearms examiners to be able to just concentrate on the lab requests for uh, high profile cases or whatever else they need to be doing. Our knifing personnel in Phoenix can swab for DNA. So if there's a gun that needs to be test fired, but the detective wants 
some DNA swabbing only, then the NIBIN personnel will swab the gun and preserve those swabs. They can't, however, do prints. So if that's the case, a detective needs that, it will go to the lab and get processed there before uh, it's sent to get test fired. In Arizona, we also have units, uh, NIBIN machines in the Mesa Police Department. That's an east suburb of Phoenix. Uh, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and Tucson PD down in Southern Arizona, as, long, as well as Border Patrol in Tucson. That's where their evidence site is. And Border Patrol recently got their own machine, so they do that. Tucson and Border Patrol also, um, and MCSO, uh, offer anybody to come down and use their equipment as well. Next slide. This is just a workflow map that we made up to show personnel kind of how the best uh, practices might be. Of course, the responding officers are uh, going to crime scenes, collecting the evidence or a gun, either a shell casing or a, a gun, and then uh, it has to be test fired and the cases have to be put into the NIBIN. Now, if there's a gun, we throw in tracing also. If there's an obliterated serial number to a gun, then we'd have to restore that to try to get the trace information. It was obliterated for some reason. And then, of course, the results of the test fire or the scene casings go into NIBIN. And if we do get a, a NIBIN lead, then it goes to the facilitators. And that would be myself and the investigators to put the case together and to put it out for an investigation and hopefully lead to an arrest. And that's what we definitely want to see are success stories and uh, see the detectives really go after these shooters and uh, put them in jail. Next slide. When we first began our program here in Phoenix, there were officers would go to scenes and see a casing and really not know what to do with them. If it was just a shots fired call or a shot spotter activation, uh, they wouldn't know, should I write this report? Should I just take these casings and pitch them? Who knows what? But what we started to do from the very beginning is we did workshops and trainings, roll call. We did videos, we did hit every briefing. We educated anybody that has to do with evidence at all, even the secretaries, if they're processing reports and they happen to see that uh, their shell casings or a gun seized in a case, that they knew that this should be processed for NIBIN. So it took us months and uh, years, and we still continue this, to educate everybody that has to do with evidence on the good things about NIBIN and tracing. So that's really paid off. We now see reports coming in with just cartridge casings on them that the officer will put in the report. A uh, neighbor found these in the street, so I took them and impounded them, and then we put them in the NIBIN. Um, one thing I do want to point out for the, the DAs or the prosecutors that are on the call, we conducted training for these uh, county attorneys here, and it really uh, educated them as well as because they wanted usually to prosecute a gun case, they wanted a gun to go to the firearms examiners for, for a full blown um, function test, which really backed up the log and or the, the, the lab, but also it really, all they wanted to know is that the gun went bang. Well, if we have a gun and our personnel test fire it, now the county attorney is happy with that because we have somebody that can testify that they took the gun and they shot it, it went bang and here's the casings. Anything up and beyond that, of course, has to go to firearms examiners, but at least that really cut down and assists the prosecutors in pr proceeding with trial. We continue to do the workshops and briefings and prepare a video roll calls for officers just as reminders. And we also have an intraweb on the police department website that officers can go to and find anything they want to know about NIBIN or tracing guns. Next slide. What we do here is once we do get a NIBIN lead, 
I get notified right away. And once I get that, I get the police reports from whatever agency is involved in the, the lead. And I will get those reports and read them and look and see if there's any investigative uh, leads that we could jump on and identify a shooter right away. Regardless if it's uh, something solvable at this point or not, I still have to put together a um, working uh, worksheet that I send out to the detectives or the special agents so that they can proceed with how the, however they want to. Now, it's very important to have very good contacts with all of our agencies that participate in our NIBIN program because I have to depend on them to send me the police reports. And so far to date, it's been phenomenal. So that's another part of bridging the gap where if I didn't have those people, I would have to take a trip out to that department and go through the public records and all that stuff. But having them in-house really helps speed up and I get the reports the same day I get the hit. So that's uh, a, a very good um, tool for us. Once I get the, the reports and I read them, I prepare a NIBIN worksheet, lead worksheet, and you'll see one in a few slides. And what this has on it is uh, the crimes that are linked and a short synopsis of what each case involves. And then at the end, I'll put in some investigative suggestions to the investigators so that they don't have to pull both reports spend the time to read and some, you know, if it's a 200 page report, he really doesn't have the time to do that. So I'll do it for him. And then I will send it out to the agents and also to the case agent from whatever department it is. We also keep track of all of our hits on a spreadsheet. And the way we used to do it, if we got a hit today, we would call it 2017-1 and we would write it up and we'd keep it on our spreadsheet. And then maybe down the road, we get a hit and we find out that today's hit now links back to 2017-1. And it got very confusing for the detectives when we send them out and we would tell them, the hit you got today on August 20th links to something we got in January. And, you know, they have to go back and forth with these lead sheets and try to determine all the information. So what we did at the first of this year we changed our recording system to crime gun number one, and now we're up to crime gun 146, I think, today. What we do now is when we get casings from a scene, and it's a Nibin lead, we know that those casings came from one particular gun. So we will call that gun one. If in this case, in this crime scene, we seized a nine millimeter and 40 casings, we know that we have two guns, so it would be gun one and gun two. Any leads we get from this point on will all be clumped together with gun one or gun two as they are identified. And once we get the gun, then it's joined up with all those reports, and we know that now we have that gun off the street, and now that that person, whoever had that gun, might be responsible for all those. When we send them out to the detectives now, it's a running sheet that has all the gun and all the casings that are linked to it and it makes it so much easier for them to, to decipher um, what's going on if we get a, an incident or a bunch of leads where there's a lot of um, leads we'll send out a uh, an i2 chart something like that just so that they can see it clearly in, in front of them next slide Now, the pursue and apprehend section of this, again, we assign, especially the cases where we look and we see that for sure this case could be solved, it'll go to our ATF agents because they have a little more time to pursue these leads. The first thing they must do, though, is contact the case agent from whatever police agency is involved in this uh, incident. And they'll ask them if they want to work it with them, if they don't care if uh, we work it all by, ATF works it all by themselves, or if they want to work in conjunction. And 99% of the time, it's ATF, you can take it and run with it. And the way ATF does it, the agents will do the entire thing. And when it comes time for getting close to arrest, they'll include the case agent from that department, and they'll work it together. 
and then they'll file the charges together with the case agent doing that. And that's worked out really, really well for us. And it, it, it helps. And what we've had some really good successes with the agents going out and re-interviewing a witness or a victim who maybe didn't want to talk that night of the shooting. But after a week, maybe they cooled down and they really are not um, apprehensive about talking to the police again. And we've, we turned a case from we thought was just a shots fired case into a five victim aggravated assault case because the agent went out and interviewed the victim again. And the victim was actually being held down on the ground with a gun to his head. And one of his friends pushed the gun away and that's when the gun went off. And that was reported as a shots fired case when it turned out that it was not. And we ended up arresting the suspect for aggravated assaults. So that worked out good. And that's why it's important to have somebody that can really spend the time on these follow-ups uh, to do that. We utilize um, bullets and officer safety bulletins on people we know that are involved in shootings, but we can't find them. Uh, we'll put that out there because say if we know somebody keeps being identified in shootings, we have their name, but we can't catch them with the gun. We'll put it out to the patrol officers because if this guy's got a suspended license and they can put him in jail for four months or six months on a misdemeanor charge or anything, at least he's not out shooting. And we know that we have that shooter off the street for a while. And of course, the bottom line is to arrest those shooters any way we can to get them off the street. Now, you know, we had a recent incident where we had um, a serial killer. Of course, that is quite a, a, a linked case with like nine incidents. We know that's a serial case. Like the next week, we had um, some guy that was going and just randomly shooting houses. He shot four houses in a car. Well, he, I guess, uh, didn't know it, but he accidentally hit an officer's house. So you know where that went to, right to the top of the list. And they were thinking, okay, well, this is a serial shooter also. And they ended up putting a lot of time in arresting that suspect. But you got to realize that when we get a hit of two cases or a hit of six cases or three cases that are all linked, they're all serial shooters. Uh, just because one's killing people, it, yeah, that's more serious. But when we have a guy that's just out there shooting at cars or doing whatever, that's a serial shooter also. If he's shooting at that stuff, he's not going to hesitate to shoot at a person or anything. So those people are just as important to be getting off of the street. Next. Our feedback uh, is very important to us because you probably felt it in your careers from day one where you did some extraordinary job and you didn't hear anything about it. Well, anytime we get an Ivan lead, we let the officer, the CSI personnel, anybody that collected that casing or anything, anybody that had to do with that casing or that gun know that what they did led to a link through Nibin. We sent them a little thank you that's down there on the bottom there that we just let them know that the evidence was linked. And then I send them the lead worksheet so they can see a summary of the crimes themselves. And I also send it to their sergeant so they have something to talk about uh, in their briefings. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't do that yet. <laughs> um, we also send out an executive summary when we get a success successful arrest out of an Ivan lead. We'll send a, an, an executive summary that has all the details of the case and who did it to um, up to the police chief so that they realize that the, their personnel are really uh, making a difference in taking shooters off of the street. We also, um, through FT and Brandon, on really good cases that lead to an arrest, we request a storyboard, which is just a like a maybe a one foot by two foot board that has a series of events on it that leads to an arrest. And those are awesome to put out to not only the lab, maybe a detective in their work unit that they can hang up. FT will do these for you free of charge and they're nice to see hanging up on a wall inside the lab or the detective section that they did what they did was a really good job. We also do quarterly meetings where we have all of our uh, participants meet 
and the supervisors if possible. And we go over any kind of successes, any problems, anything that the program has to offer. Uh, and to, it keeps everybody updated as to what everybody's doing. We have a round table, so everybody has to participate in that and tell us how they're doing as far as the four critical steps there. So that's been very useful and keeps everybody um, very active and, and involved in, into our program. Next. This is a sample of the worksheet that I put out. And you'll see it if you download the um, PowerPoint. It just has each agency case, one, two, and sometimes we have six or 10 or 15 cases that are all linked. And it, it just has the department, their police report number, what kind of crime, what kind of evidence uh, we've, we've received. Next. And then this page shows each synopsis of each crime and then my suggestions for follow-up on the bottom. Now, a detective can take that and do what he wants with it, but it just saves him some time. And I must point out that every agency does this different, and every agency has a different um, level of personnel that might send these out. Um, I've been around the police department, and now most departments for some time well, for 40 years, so a lot of people know me and know what kind of work product I can put out to them versus maybe somebody that's brand new and doesn't have any law enforcement experience to put these out. The detective may get it and say, who is this sending me this? And, and on top of that, who is this telling me which way my investigation should go? Um, but it is important. We did have a case where a detective got that and he was kind of upset about that. We would tell him which way his uh, investigation went. But after he read our investigative comments and he looked at the police report, he saw clearly that these things that we suggested were overlooked originally and they never had been followed up. So that is very important uh, to do. Next, okay, next slide. This is just a sample of um, a crime bulletin that we put out. This guy did a shooting. He was on video at a, re at a store. We didn't know who he was. He paid by cash. so. He didn't uh, leave credit card information. We had no idea. We ended up pull it, putting this on a silent witness uh, board and the guy saw it himself on TV and called in and turned himself in. And that turned into a, a pretty good case where he was identified and he admitted to doing some aggravated assault. So these are important to put out. Uh, put them out to your patrol officers, the detectives. And if you have any kind of crime stoppers or cr silent witness uh, programs in your area, that would be a really good thing to put out if you have great photos like this guy. Next slide. That's all I have to put forward right now. Um, this is my information and you can feel free to contact me anytime. I can go into a lot of our different programs really in depth. If you have any questions, please type them in and I'll answer them. And if not, I will turn it over to Chief Newdigate. Great, thank you everyone. Thanks, Daryl, I appreciate it. Paul Newdigate here, uh, Assistant Chief with the Cincinnati Police Department. Just a quick bio, I'm in my 28th year and I am currently the Patrol Bureau Commander in charge of about 750 sworn. Uh, I do oversee our gang enforcement and our pivot unit efforts. So in conjunction with my partner in the Investigations Bureau, we do drive our violence and gun violence reduction strategies for Cincinnati. Um, what I just wanna present and what we're gonna go over is what works for us. Uh, just caution that it is a way, not the way. Um, why we do believe it's beneficial. We were one of the few uh, large Midwest urban cities to see actual reductions in both fatal shootings and total non-fatal shootings last year. So we believe that we do have some good strategies in place. Next slide, please. Um, just real briefly, we just kind of want to talk about where we came from uh, for several years, 2007 to 13. We strictly put all of our eggs in the basket with David Kennedy's group violence interruption model, which we relabeled to the Cincinnati Initiative to Reduce Violence. It was strictly focused on the group and gang member disruption, where you build a gang case, and then we call them into a big setting at the courthouse with the federal prosecutor, judges, 
and then we give them the option that uh, you know the next body that drops we're going to bury you under the jail along with the rest of the gang or we offer them the alternative of social services uh, education um, uh, employment assistance and uh, that worked semi successfully for about a six year period uh, and then it lost its its teeth um, in 2007, we had over 2,000 identified gang members, and we have just over 700 now, and that's due to a proliferation of reasons that we can talk about. Um, one of the things that it also lacked was the teeth, that federal prosecution that uh, we were uh, advising all the participants. Um, we just lost the ability and that cooperation, and like Daryl and everybody else stresses, the relationships with all of our partners, especially our federal partners, have to be there. Um, we've been very lucky over about the last 18 months. Federal prosecutions uh, for us have increased over 50%, and we truly believe that we are getting a, a big return on our investment with uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office. And like I mentioned, you go into those call-ins and you you extend them the olive branch for you know educational help and employment help, but it never seemed to materialize from our external partners. Next slide. So even with a successful gang disruption, and we would go in and we would have a call in, um, we were very lucky to get a 90, maybe 120 day window uh, where we get a cessation of violence for that certain uh, gang or geographical area. So, you know, we started thinking that's a ton of work to disrupt a gang, uh, have a call in, uh, bring all these resources to the table for really a, a 90 day window, and then we're trying to replicate it again. Um, and then from 2013 to 2016, we had a revolving chief's chair, and we really did not have a defined violence reduction strategy. Next slide, please. So in 2016, uh, with some new people at the table, uh, an internal chief that's understood where we've come from, uh, we developed what we call Serve 2.0, and we really base it off working off the uh, the crime triangle. You know, we've always believed that we can pull one leg of the crime triangle out uh, and reduce crime. What we have found is most of the time uh, we are having to address two sides uh, almost simultaneously, both the offender and the location. So our model looks at violent people, violent places, which is new for us, victims, and then the guns. Next slide, please. When we talk about violent people, um, our offender strategy, even though we have moved away from the traditional call-in model, uh, we still do it in, in very small numbers. And instead of doing it in the big courthouse setting pioneered by David Kennedy, uh, we keep the number small and then we actually go out to the community and hold it in their setting and try to make it less confrontational. Um, we are still seeing some slight residual benefit for that. Um, effectiveness of that strategy for us is, uh, probably a little negligible, but it's definitely a tool in the toolbox that you can utilize, and we still use it when we believe that it is the appropriate strategy. Where we've really moved forward, uh, much like many of you have probably already done, is we just had to reinvigorate our priority offender project. Next slide, please. Um, with priority offenders, much like everyone else, we had 426 people shot in the city of Cincinnati last year. I did not have 426 individuals that pulled the trigger once and shot one of our citizens. I have 40 to 50 hardcore trigger pullers that were repeatedly engaged in gun violence. Uh, so we stood back up our monthly meeting uh, with CPD, ATF, FBI, U.S. Attorney, our local sheriff, the county prosecutor to go after these individuals that we know have uh, engaged in homicidal violence, they've engaged in multiple shootings, and we just have not been able to close the homicides or the shootings. So now we go after them with uh, you know, the, the focus to build those additional um, gun and dope cases, and then take them for federal prosecution for a 922G or even a 924C. And I think that goes back to what are we really looking to accomplish we're looking to reduce gun violence by any means necessary. And if I can get you charged and convicted on a 922G, a federal weapons under disability, and get you seven years in a prison in Kansas away from Cincinnati, that is a win. Next slide, please. Uh, something that's very different from us, violent places. 
We've all engaged in place-based policing over the years, but this is really taking it to the next level for us. Uh, next slide. You know, what we have found is that shootings and gun crime are a significant problem, and at least for us, they are highly concentrated and saturated in the same areas. So just disrupting the gang activity, very small return on investment, maybe 90 days. So now what we've done is we attack the offenders and then the locations in an almost near simultaneous effort. Next slide. Uh, that is just a, a rolling density map to show the, the concentration of violent crime in the city. It's pretty consistent from year to year uh, based on a rolling five years of data of uh, homicides, aggravated assaults, gun runs, and aggravated robberies. We came up with 23 what we call systematically, systemically violent locations in the city, and these are the areas that we focus on. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, I think, is very telling um, for Cincinnati of those 23 locations that we have identified as systemically violent. They account for 1.4% of our total land mass. Uh, we have 77 square miles in the city. They account for 1.4% of that. And that uh, those 23 locations account for 14.4% of our total Part 1 crime. When we break it down into our Part 1 violent, they account for a quarter of our violent crime. And then I think the big telling piece for us that tells us that we believe that we're going in the right direction, 42% of our shooting victims are in just those 23 locations. Next slide, please. So to address those chronically violent locations, we came up with a strategy that we call PIVOT, is place-based investigations of violent offender territory. And it's composed of three components, a city resource team, community resources, and then our outside resources. Next slide. In the way that Pivot works, much like our traditional uh, gang and group member disruption, we identify the gangs in those locations. Gang enforcement in conjunction with usually ATF go in, build cases against the gang network, disrupt that gang activity. And then while they're disrupting that a gang activity. I've got uh, a lieutenant, uh, a sergeant, and four dedicated officers that just do the place-based enforcement for the chronically violent locations. So go and disrupt the gangs, then we disrupt those locations that give comfort to the gangs, and hopefully what we're able to do then is at that point the community is able to come in and establish some sustainability and we get uh, much longer than a 90-day return on our investment. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about pivot, it is just not a police department initiative for the place-based side. As you can see, we've got multiple city departments and external agencies that uh, meet with us on a monthly basis. And we come up with a coordinated, dedicated strategy on how to attack that chronic violent location. And uh, having all those partners at the table has worked wonders. I mean, we've all had different code enforcement uh, uh, efforts such as CERT, but this is really for us taking it to a new level. Next slide, please. Um, for this to work for us, uh, one of the big things is you have to have buy-in from your city administration. The city manager mandates that all these different uh, entities come to the table monthly and that they participate in our our place-based enforcement. And without uh, the city administration, I doubt that the police department would be able to keep that together. So that is a, a big takeaway that we need to continue to have um, the buy-in from city administration. So we meet monthly um, and it is a coordinated group that disrupts these chronic locations so that the community can uh, get some long-term sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, our very first coordinated pivot project was in an area uh, in District 3 called Westwood. When we first started, we were averaging one shooting in that location every 17 days. After gangs went in, disrupted the, the gang activity, pivot went in and addressed three uh, of our most problematic locations. We now average 44 days between shootings, 
and that has now been consistent over about uh, the last nine months, and we have not relapsed back to that 17 days. Next slide. Um, the very next piece that we have is our victimization. Next slide. Much like many other departments that uh, experience a large share of gun violence, um, about two-thirds of all of our shootings, the victims and witnesses are non-cooperative. Um, we really, for the most part, don't know where many of these occurred because over 50% of them are fleeing the scene. They're arriving at our local uh, level one trauma center, and then we're back trying to actually find out where they occurred. So uh, victimization and reducing victimization on that crime triangle side has been a very challenging piece for Cincinnati. Uh, to attack the homicides, we implemented CCRO, which is our citizens, Cincinnati Citizens Respect Our Witnesses program, is a full-time social services advocate out of our homicide unit that does nothing but work with the victims and families of uh, the homicide uh, victims and witnesses to make sure that we get successful prosecutions. Uh, where we are lacking is that same social services piece for the other 375, 380 shooting victims that we have per year. Um, so as a result of not being able to come up with a very uh, successful victimization strategy, uh, we have a great reliance on technology such as ShotSpotter, Nibin, and our camera system. And if anybody out there does have a proven victimization uh, strategy that you believe would work, um, please shoot me a message. And, and I'd be love to love to talk that over with you. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about guns, much like uh, Daryl and uh, Brandon talked about, uh, we have a heavy emphasis on Nibin and Shot Spotter. Next slide, please. So for guns, uh, we just implemented Shot Spotter. Um, so I can't uh, attest to how successful it's going to be. We already know that we are seeing some. Uh, some successes short term. One of the big ones is, like I mentioned, shooting victims that lie to us where it occurred. Um, we've already caught a couple of them in their lies and they've admitted that it didn't occur there when we confronted them with the shot spotter evidence. Uh, we are seeing numerous locations since we went live where we had no idea that there were shots fired activity going on. We believe a lot of these is really target practice for our bad guys. Uh, we have a lot of can guns that are stolen out of houses and burglaries and theft from autos and cars, and they're going to these vacant houses and lots and engaging in a little target practice before they go out and engage in their nefarious illegal activities. And now we're doing surveillance on some of these locations, and I think that uh, ShotSpotter is going to be a very effective strategy for us. You know, what it's doing right now is it's uh, providing us with additional uh, ballistic trace evidence recoveries. Uh, those shell casings that we feed into Nibin, uh, and then we move into E-Trace, and of course all this is done with uh, the thought of building federal, uh, when applicable, or state charges against these individuals. Next slide. Just touching on ShotSpotter, we, we are seeing um, exactly the same results right now that uh, we know from other cities that implement it, uh, Denver, Milwaukee, um, there was just a recent study that NYPD put out. They're currently uh, implementing uh, almost 60 square miles of shot spotter coverage, and only 16% of all their shots fired activity is being called into 911. I think uh, empirically across the board, they say it's less than 20%. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing right now for the short time that we've been live. It is about 15% of our shots, shots fired activity is being called in. Um, you know, it does give us quicker response. It does give us that precise location, um, but it's really telling us where we need to focus our resources and our efforts. For those of us that, you know, consider yourself a data-driven evidence-based agency, it's extremely difficult to deploy your resources and attack the, the right locations if you don't even know where 80% of your shooting activity is occurring. And I think that's what ShotSpotter brings for those that are implementing it that can attest to it. Um, it is definitely giving us much more advanced notice on what we need to focus on. Next slide. Um, Niven is a critical piece. I truly believe that Niven is the base layer of uh, all of our gun violence restructuring uh, 
gun violence reduction strategies. Um, just some brief background, we did have Nibin in place, our local coroner's lab, up until 2010. It was removed due to lack of use, um, and I think that's what we found. There's a big push by ATF as we move forward uh, that these machines need to be embedded in the police department. It needs to be where it, we can make it an organizational priority, and we know that sometimes that does not occur with our friends at our coroner's office and our crime labs. They're inundated with many other tasks, and sometimes they just can't make it the priority that we would like them to see. Uh, our machine is embedded in the Cincinnati Police Department, and it is the priority in regards to shooting violence. So, um, next slide, please. How we got down this road, um, Queen City Tower shooting, January of 2015. On four separate occasions, we had an individual drive past uh, one of our high rise owned by one of our local billionaires in downtown Cincinnati and fire rounds into the building on four separate occasions. So you can imagine the political pushback and the priority to solve this case. Next slide, please. Now that's just a brief timeline of when these incidents occurred over about uh, a 20, uh, two or three week window. Next slide. Um, much like anything else, we conducted an extensive investigation, interviewed dozens upon dozens of people, uh, canvassed hundreds of business, hundreds of hours of CCTV footage review. Uh, we did cell phone tower dumps of all the towers in the vicinity, but we really had no idea what we were looking for. So pretty much after a year, we still had no usable leads. Um, but we were very lucky that we recovered shell casings from those scenes. And a detective that was familiar with Nibin from when we had had it previously, drove him up north and had him entered uh, into, uh, into their Nibin up at Miami Valley Crime Lab. Next slide. And then uh, Mr. Ray Sean Harold came in the picture. Uh, we were very lucky one of our felonious assaults was caught on camera. Uh, Mr. Ray Sean Harold, as you can see, uh, is very talented. He was able to talk on the phone and return fire uh, against an individual at the same time. Um, based on the footage, we obtained uh, warrants for the felonious assault. Fugitive apprehension went out and picked him up. And then, lo and behold, uh, we entered those into Nibin. Uh, our good friends at ATF said we will ship those off, get them entered to see if we get a match. And next slide. We're very lucky that the, the nine, Glock 19 that he was in possession of when we arrested him is the same one that uh, matched casings from three of our four Queen City Tower shootings. Next slide. Uh, this is just uh, the initial early correlation sheet showing uh, his Glock 19 to the Queen City Tower shooting, plus uh, three other shootings that we were not aware of. Uh, the, the big takeaway that we got from that is um, Mr. Rayshon Harold had absolutely no connection to Queen City Tower. And the way it played out is once we identified him as a viable suspect, he was already in state prison, serving time for the aforementioned felonious assault. Uh, our detectives and ATF task force officers went up there, interviewed Mr. Rayshon Harold, and were able to obtain a confession. And next slide, please. And as a result uh, of that singular Nibin match, we identified Rayshon, otherwise we would still be investigating this case today, um, and we were able to successfully prosecute him in the uh, Southern District of Ohio on one count of uh, 922G, and he accepted a plea on that case for eight years. So that singular case right there was enough to convince my chief to spend asset forfeiture funds to buy our own Nibin machine and bring it home to CPD. Next slide, please. Uh, as a result of that one, as I mentioned, we purchased our own Nibin system. Uh, it's embedded in the PD where it is absolutely uh, an organizational priority. Um, one of the things that I can caution is what's worked well for us is we took two trained seasoned detectives and had them buy into the process. Uh, individual that was on the FBI task force and another one that were on the ATF, um, they became our Nyman coordinators. And 
we originally did not have the buy-in from the department that we needed, but by having individuals that uh, they respected, that have been long tenured street cops and detectives, to have them go out to the roll calls and sell the advantages of Niven for us was instrumental. You know, unfortunately, if I'd put a, a civilian criminalist in that same spot, I don't think we would have got the same buy-in and we would not be as successful now with uh, the use of Niven. Next slide. Uh, these are just a couple of the examples of the uh, the different matches um, that we were getting the investigative leads. Um, just like Daryl mentioned, these are leads um, of the hundreds upon hundreds that we have uh, generated since we went live. I think one or two have been confirmed by a firearms examiner. Uh, these are strictly leads, and uh, it's been very successful operating as that investigative tool and not a forensic tool like it used to be um, when it was previously up in the coroner's office. Next slide. And we can skip those. Next slide. Uh, this is one where back July of 2016, just go over it briefly, had an individual, carload of individuals that uh, pulled up in front of my 5th Police District early in the morning and uh, fired off uh, several 45 caliber casings. Um, immediate response, collected the casings because uh, Nyman's housed internally. We had them entered into the system within uh, just a couple of hours. We are very lucky that we are part of the National Correlation Center. Um, called the Correlation Center first thing in the morning, said they're in the system. Will you uh, expedite uh, the analysis? Within 18 hours from the time of the shooting, we had a match. And as you can see at the bottom is uh, on July 19th, where we had the shooting in the District 5, and it linked to three other felonious assaults that we had had, including one that occurred June 13th with uh, three identified suspects. And once we started looking into those individuals, uh, looked at some surveillance footage, we definitely believe that these they were involved, that these were the ones. Um, within 24 hours, we were knocking on their doors. We were doing consent searches. Uh, we made gun charges on two of them, and I think a dope charge on the third. As I mentioned, we never did put them down for the shooting into the district, but we brought additional charges uh, and there were no additional shootings into the police facilities. And that was pretty much right at that time that Dallas and Baton Rouge were going on. So we thought, you know, this is only going to be the beginning. One district's going to be shot up. We're going to have repeat offenses. I think that timely intervention uh, with Nyben kept that from happening. Next slide. Brandon's already covered this, uh, so we will go to the next slide, please. And just how it works for us, as mentioned, uh, all firearm ballistic evidence is equal. Um, you can't just put in your homicide cases. You can't just be putting in your felonious assault cases. You have to put in those shell casings that we get called that are laying in the street, uh, the shots fired into the stop signs that occur, the shots fired in the air. They are all equally important. And this was an organizational mindset for us that can't show up at these scenes and there's not a body in the street, no one's flagging us down and just kick those shell casings into the gutter. Um, they have to be tagged and they all have to have equal priority. Next slide. This is absolutely critical for us. Uh, that ballistic trace evidence has to be entered within 48 hours. And then, uh, as I mentioned with the Correlation Center, we were very, very lucky that most times they will provide a response back to us within 72 hours. And then uh, if there is no correlation, we usually find that out within a week. Next slide. Now how we do it here, and I know other departments do it differently, that when those NIBIN investigative leads come in, they have dedicated individuals that they assign them to. I'm very lucky that I have over 70 investigators at my disposal, and those go back out to the district section commanders for immediate assignment. Uh, that follow-up piece that is extremely critical is after they receive it, 45 days, they have to do follow-up investigations, and then they have to come back in and present to uh, the senior command staff 
at our weekly STARS meeting, which is our version of ComStat, and they have to lay out what investigative follow-up was done and what we did with that lead. Uh, absolutely critical. We make sure that it just doesn't sit in some detective's bin and we waste a, a very valuable investigative lead. Next slide. This is just an example of uh, uh, the correlation investigative follow-up that uh, detectives will come in and present. Uh, they'll make the connection and they will talk about what the investigative follow-up steps are. And many times it's the same that we, we have a suspect the investigative the Nyman lead tells us that we have the right suspect, but the victim is uncooperative. So now we're developing additional strategies to target them for a, a drug or a gun buy that we can make charges, try to get them off the street. Next slide, please. Uh, the feedback loop, like Daryl uh, explained, is critical. Um, this is something that we didn't always do from the beginning, but you have to keep the recovering officer involved in that feedback loop. So the patrol officer that goes out there and picks up those shell casings and does a, a heck of a report on that felonious assault, they've got to know and be involved in that feedback loop that their efforts resulted in this knife and match, which linked this individual to this felonious assault, this homicide. Uh, it's absolutely critical that we keep them plugged in to the success of the program if we want it to be uh, successful. One of the things that we've done recently is developed a searchable NIBIN database. So when these leads go out, um, any of the investigators can go in and search to see if an individual has ever been identified as part of one of our NIBIN investigative lead recoveries um, because that information was pretty much housed only with the detectives. Now it's searchable for the entire department. And, and once again, that goes back in. This has to be uh, an organizational priority for the entire department, not just uh, you know a few select officers in ATF and our gang squad, uh, but everybody involved. Next slide, please. That's just a breakdown of how uh, you know we're lucky enough that we're able to dedicate uh, one sergeant and six officers uh, directly to ATF. We have a dedicated analyst, which for us is absolutely critical to manage uh, these uh, correlations for us. Um, one of the big things is it's real easy for me to sit in the assistance chief chair and say that we're going to do this, that this is a priority, but we all know how that works. Um, but to have those guys, and those detectives, they're invested in the process, going out to the roll call still and selling it, you know, the best thing that I've ever heard is, hey, when we started down here and he asked us to be the Nibin techs, we really didn't buy into it. But now I can't tell you what a great program it is. And they continue to sell that at the patrol officer level. So they get it from the bottom and from the top. And it, it keeps the, the middle vibrant. So next slide, please. Just reiterating how critical we believe it is that uh, your nine machine, um, your brass tracks, and, and your match point be under your control uh, in your PD or wherever you are, and that it is treated as an investigative tool and not a forensic tool. Um, one of the things when we did buy our own Nibin, we didn't just buy it with CPD in mind. We bought it for with in mind as a regional gun crime initiative. There are 46 other municipal agencies in Hamilton County. Of those 46, we have 20 of them entering their own ballistic trace evidence, and we are matching our gun crimes to theirs and vice versa. Uh, we sent our own individuals down to become trained to trainers. And much like Daryl said, if uh, you want to send your people to us, we will train them to do the acquisitions. And uh, we really want to lock down the entire region for gun crime, and I think we are well on our way to doing that. Next slide, please. Talk about E-Trace, um, this is just a brief uh, example. I think this is from last year of the different firearms that we recovered. It just shows you, for those that have been in this business a, a while like uh, I have and Daryl, that the days of Raven 25s and 22s, those don't exist. These are all high quality firearms that are coming into our possession. Glocks 9s, 40, Smith & Wesson 40s. Um, next slide. As part of that E-Trace, we do take a look at our FFLs. Um, target holdings on the left is a large uh, 
conglomerate. They sell a lot of firearms, so of course we expect that they will have the most firearms recovered. But the ones that are problematic for us that we want to take a look at are, are the like the Roy Lynn Iker, the individual that has the FFL in his basement, and we are recovering crime guns on a routine basis. You know, Mr. Hensley, um, we're going to have some conversations on why those guns keep uh, being recovered in the uh, community of the city of Cincinnati. Next slide. Bridging the gaps. As I mentioned, comprehensive collection is absolutely critical. Um, we have to collect every piece of evidence. It has to be entered timely, and we have got to get those leads back to the detectives uh, as quick as we can so that they can follow up. Um, talk about buy-in from the department. It, they didn't even consider Nibin, but now we have homicide and the district investigators calling the Nibin coordinators. Hey, I'm coming down with a piece of evidence. I need to get this in. Can we recall the Nibin coordinator? I'd like to get this in right away. Um, we do not have the luxury you do not have the luxury of submitting that evidence and sending it off and allowing it to sit in someone's uh, property room for weeks before it's entered. If gun violence is a priority for your community, we just cannot accept that. Next slide, please. Um, just to reiterate, even when we identify suspects, we are still going to have the same non-cooperative victims and witnesses. So we do not get hung up about closing that felonious assault, but it's about putting additional charges and making sure that they don't pull the trigger again. A lot of what we do, yes, like everybody else, we want to close the cases. We want a uh, high clearance rate, but more so it's about preventing them or removing them from pulling the trigger and putting additional bodies on our investigative plate. And that's really what our priority offender strategy brings. We've been very successful in and going after these individuals and taking them off one by one, um, which seems to be working for us because we are, we're about the same in gun violence as we were last year, which was an 11% reduction. Um, and once again, the end goal is to prevent further shootings and reduce the violent crime in your communities. Next slide, please. I cannot stress uh, uh, the relationship building. Um, ATF and the U.S. Attorney, that's where we get our biggest return on investment uh, in regards to violent crime. Uh, they are always there for us. Um, our federal prosecutions have definitely doubled over the last year, and it's making a difference. Um, those guys on the street know the difference between federal prosecution and state, where for their first, second, even probably third uh, CCW or weapons under disability conviction in state, they're going to get probation. If they qualify for federal, they know that they're going, and it's given us some of that teeth back that we were lacking. Next slide. Um, just once again, it is a strategy. Uh, doesn't mean it's the strategy for your department, much like anyone else. You know, I'm looking at best practices across the country. And if your department or your agency is engaged in a strategy that seems to be working, I'm more than willing to adopt it, take a look at it, and see if it's something that can tweak and work for Cincinnati. Uh, what we have going on right now, we believe is successful. Uh, it was a 13% reduction in homicides last year. Uh, total shootings were down 11%. And uh, like I mentioned, for 2017, we are flat right now compared to 2016. And that includes having 29 victims uh, from just three separate incidents this year, including 17 uh, in one nightclub shooting that really inflated our numbers. Next slide, please. And I think this is a big one, especially for those that deal with the politicians. They're always looking for that single absolute strategy whether it's you know a uh, focused offender, it's the group violence interruption, what are you doing to reduce your gun violence? And I continue to tell them there is no singular strategy. There's a series of over interlocking, overlapping strategies, and what works well today may not work well tomorrow, won't work next month. Um, and we continue to evaluate it on a daily basis. But uh, you know you have your base layers there, your shot spotter, your knife, and everything else is fluid and dynamic. And you know what I talked about that works for CPD today, 
This may not be the strategy two months from now. It could very well change, but I think it's a, a very solid uh, uh, basis for us to move on, and, and I hope uh, hope uh, you enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Brandon? Yep. Thanks, Lieutenant Colonel. Really appreciate it. I'm um, going to close out here. I know we've gone a little bit over, but I know that uh, between uh, Daryl and Assistant Chief Newtigate, lots of great information. We really appreciate your participation. We had a great turnout for today's webinar. We want to leave everyone with a few resources. There's a ton of information out there. Um, this website, crimegunintelcenters.org, that's been put together by ATF, DOJ, DJ, and the Police Foundation, there is a tremendous amount of outstanding resources available on this, uh, on this website, including a link to another webinar um, that was held recently uh, regarding overcoming victim witness intimidation and gaining cooperation for investigation. So a lot of good information there. Um, next one. Uh, this one is going to be made available through Justice Clearinghouse. Um, this was put together a couple years ago after a webinar that Steve Barberini and Lori Van Dusen presented. And this is a good way to help promote the proper handling of evidence and how to pr uh, proceed with these cases. These are good handouts to give out throughout the department. New Jersey State Police have put together a great um, resource as well based on their rapid assessment into NIBIN or RAIN program. Um, they make it into a format so that you can put them in the patrol vehicles and that too. So good, good information there. Next, this ATF Police Officer's Guide to Recovered Firearms is available um, online and an app can be downloaded as well. Lots of good information and resources in this as well. And then the last slide. Uh, we also provide the 13 Critical Tasks book uh, at no charge as well as workshops. Um, that we, we do, we uh, sponsor workshops with agencies throughout the United States and actually the rest of the world as well. These are all pro bono. We're happy to do that and work with agencies uh, to host these in-person workshops as well. Next slide. So uh, again, we've run a little bit late on time. I don't know if we're gonna have time for any questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron here in a second, but here's our contact information for Daryl, Assistant Chief Newtigate and myself, and I know that I, uh, we will all be available for questions if you want to contact us offline individually. Uh, I have the opportunity to visit um, labs and uh, sites throughout the United States, and there's a lot of, as Assistant Chief Newtigate noted, there's a lot of different approaches with this, and we're happy to share uh, information on best practices with you. So, Aaron, I'll turn it back over to you to close it out. You bet, and I'll make it really brief. Again, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Newtigate, uh, Daryl Smith, Brandon, thank you guys very much for your amazing presentation today. Provided some really good new information and about the essential nature of multidisciplinary approaches to these kind of challenging problems. Um, with that, this does conclude today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. We look forward to having you back in September where we will uh, have number, uh, number five, rather, of our webinar series on gun crime intelligence. Until then, Please stay safe. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.